Welcome everyone. Um, we have uh, now uh, Guillaume and his group from uh, Science Pro Media Lab uh, talking about alternative indexing structures for graphs. So uh, starting with a simple index, they were, had requests or had a requirement to have a really scalable and very capable index, and they want to talk to about how to how to develop and design such a multi-level index uh, today. So welcome. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to your talk <laughs> after I'm back for five minutes. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Just before we start, uh, if some slides are not very clear from the end of the room, we have put the slides online, so that's for your convenience. Um, well, I'm going to pose the problem we have tried to solve, and I need to explain what is Hive. I will try to make a one-minute demo, and then I will explain why we had this problem that we tried to to solve. So, uh, yes, these are the slides. Why is it selected? Yes. So, Hive is a web crawler. So, it's about downloading uh, web pages and looking at the network of hyperlinks. Um, it's made for research. So, researchers will typically uh, download the network of web pages and look at it. So, let me just uh, show you how it looks like. This is my, oops. Um, no. Nope. No. Sorry. Can I just? Yeah. Sorry, not a Mac user, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. So, I'm, I cannot make a real demo, of course, but you can look at this demo. You have the you have the the links are is easily findable on Google. Uh, I tried this morning um, a corpus about the first dem, and what I did is just crawl the first dem website and then the website around, as long as they contain the word libre or open or free. So basically what you would do is uh, https firstdem.org. This is the firstdem website. I would just declare a web entity. I will explain what it is and just crawl it. It's run on our a server on Sciences Po, but the, the, the interface is on the HTML5 uh, uh, interface. And then it will crawl and crawl since I've done that I can show you the network that we obtain after a moment. And well, um, let's put the colors. So for instance, here I have tagged the, the websites and you, you can see that the, the, the website with Libre are in purple, the one with open are in blue, and the one in, with free are in green. So well, it's not very, very interesting, but at least you have an idea of uh, what we try to do. Can you just put me back on the, yeah. Okay, so the main issue here is that we have a huge amount of web pages, but web pages are not very usable because we have so many of them. So what we uh, intuitively reason on as a researcher is something such as a website, but not always a website, unfortunately. So we have to work on the structure of the URL so that we can have an intuitive notion of website that we will call web entity. So basically, we tokenize the URL in its different parts and we reorder it, that's pretty common, into what we call the LRU, which is reverse URL if you want. It's not completely re reversed, it's from the, the most um, generic part to the most specific part. So the, the first part before the, the path is reversed. Actually, they look more like that, but for the sake of simplification in my slide, I will just stick to something a little bit uh, easier to understand. So if you do that, uh, um, LRUs have a tree structure, okay? Here we have different pages in Wikipedia three articles, and this one is, if you click on history in Wikipedia, you have the history page about um, fish here, I believe, no, cat. So it doesn't have the same structure, but at least the first part um, mutualizes between the, the, the different URLs, and then you have the slash wiki slash article. site, if you want, that we call web entity. If you put it here, you will have the Wikipedia entity. If you put it after Wikipedia at en, intuitively en.wikipedia.org, you have the English Wikipedia. If you put it on bird, you have just the bird page, which is the entity that is relevant to the analysis. And you can, of course, have multiple flags. So if you do that, you have Wikipedia and also different articles that might be different entities. So let's flesh that out with some 
uh, typical users. Our first user is Audrey. She wants to study the web uh, in the sense of actors. She sees the websites connecting together. So what she would have in this case is different domains and possibly Facebook profiles. OK? In another use case, Bernard wants to study animal, oh, it's cropped, whatever, animals represented on Wikipedia. And this is, in this situation, it would be about different Wikipedia articles as different entities. And we can have sort of a meta flag spawning flags at the next level so that we know that all Wikipedia, Wikipedia pages are different pages, different entities. And finally, an even more common use case is someone who wants to study actors and documents. So some of the entities are documents and other entities are actors. So in this situation, some websites are considered, considered as actors, but also this researcher wants to look into some articles of The Guardian and pick them as relevant. So she's studying migrations. So some articles about migrations are relevant. The others are not. And they should be considered just a part of the rest of The Guardian website. So if I put colors, it means then when, with a flag, you, you declare sub-web web entities if you want, but they are considered different entities and the rest. So you have this weird intrication of entities. This is necessary to the kind of so, uh, analysis we want to do in the social sciences. And this brings a lot of complexity to the way we can structure uh, a memory structure. So what we need is to add tens of millions of LRUs. That's the, the kind of volume we want to address. Hundreds of millions of links between web pages. We want to edit the web entities afterwards and not re-index each time because the users want to change their entities because they don't agree with what the software does by, it, by itself. For, in a sense, researchers always want to tweak their results. And we want to know, we want to be able to get all the pages in the web entity. We want to be able to know in which web entity is a given page and to get the graph of web entities because th this is the purpose. We want to know at each point the graph of web entities, even though we move the flags and redefine the boundaries of the web entities. So it's a tree because of the LRU structure. It's a graph because of all the links between the pages that we use to infer links between the entities. How do we implement that? OK, <laughs> I'm going to give the mic to Benjamin. And and I am going to present to you the first implementation that we did. Ah, sorry. <laughs> you want me to push? Yeah. Let me do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just but, uh, yeah. So I'm going to show you the first uh, implementation we tried. Uh, that start that was started like at the beginning of the prog of the of the project, uh, like seven years ago. Uh, it is simply by using Lucene, as you know. Uh, because we want a tree, and Lucin allows you to create an index of elements that are searchable by prefix. So when you have a tree and you just want to uh, collect the, your pages, uh, the, I mean, the, your, the tree of URLs is just uh, uh, simple prefixes that you can query. Uh, a graph by just indexing a couple of pages, like source, target, and then you can just like query uh, all links to this uh, target by uh, querying the prefix or uh, querying all links from this source. But the problem is not only the web entities are dynamic, as uh, Mathieu explained, because users want to put flags at different places at some uh, moments, but moreover, uh, um, so, I mean, because of that, uh, links are aggregated uh, because we have uh, like links between pages, and so links between web entities are all the links between the prefixes of a web entity that are aggregated together. And so, uh, as Mathieu said, we cannot just store them. We have to compute them regularly when things are changing. And also, do you remember Bernard? Uh, he has like web entities here, but also here. So there are web entities that are sub-web entities, which prefixes are included in prefixes of other web entities. So when you're going to query, you're going to find the same prefixes uh, embedded in, in each other. So this creates another limit, is that the querying uh, with, Luc with Lucene now is, making, is becoming a lot more complex and a lot more slower, because as soon as you have sub-web entities and sub-prefixes, you need to do queries with and add uh, not clauses to your queries 
to say I want to follow this prefix, but not all of those before, or not all of those behind. So this makes the queries a little bit more complex, a little bit more slow. And so as turnarounds, uh, we started caching a lot of things, uh, caching in RAM, but also caching in Lustin by adding an intermediate level of uh, an index of links between pages and web entities. And this, uh, so we were querying a uh, first time, storing uh, temporarily uh, those intermediate objects, and then querying again these ones to get the links between uh, source and target web entities. Result was that uh, it worked for like uh, the, la the first uh, four years of the project, but as soon as we had huge corpuses, they were just like getting slow and indexing was taking so much more time than actually uh, crawling. So the crawler were finding many pages and then when we want to index, we are getting some stack uh, time and sometimes we are just saying the researchers, well, start the crawls, uh, come back in two days and uh, then <laughs> uh, you can work on your corpus. So this is why we decided to go to Copenhagen for a week, uh, uh, where Mathieu spent some time uh, as a researcher, uh, I don't know how you say that, but a visiting uh, researcher. Uh, and so we, we went to see him and tried to work for one week together on tackling this problem. So four brains, uh, the, uh, a lab called Tent Lab in, in Copenhagen, and we worked uh, simultaneously on two prototypes, two concurrent prototypes to try and solve uh, this problem. One using Neo4j, and one trying to rebuild from scratch uh, in Java uh, another structure that would be more in a tree, because we had this, this feeling that the data that we're manipulating is really trees, and so we should probably store, th store things as trees. So, that was one week of intense uh, work, uh, all working together in those uh, uh, clean uh, furnitures uh, from, uh, <laughs> from Denmark. <laughs> uh, that's all the commits uh, that were made on the two prototypes. Uh, I think the top one is uh, Neo4j when the bottom one is, uh, is uh, Java. And so <laughs> you can see all the time when we worked uh, at this time. And this is a visualization of all the beers that we had multiple times. Uh, <laughs> because uh, in Denmark, maybe you know uh, there is this uh, brand called Mikeller and you have to try it. <laughs> so this brought us to the Neo4j prototype. Okay, sorry for the intermission. So, uh, as uh, Benjamin said, we tried two prototypes. So, the first one was actually using Neo4j. Why is that? Because, like, actually, you saw, uh, we have a graph, a r rather a complex graph, and Neo4j is a graph database. So, we told ourselves this could be a good idea. So, uh, it's a tree, it's a graph. So, this is actually the schema of the Neo4j database we devised. So, uh, each of those nodes are actually uh, a stem of the LRUs, like the reversed URL. So, it's just like, for instance, here you've got HTTP, here you've got something like Google, www, and here you've got like actual pages. So, you've got the tree structure, and between those uh, pages, you also have links because this is the web. So, this is quite difficult and a bit uh, cumbersome. So, uh, the challenge we had was uh, um, like being able to like insert the data in the database and like being able to query the data in the database. So, we had to rely on really complex query and so some takeaway bonus, unwind is really your friend. If you have to do conditions in Neo4j, forage is your friend. Uh, radius, case, coalesce, and we uh, even tried some stored procedures. So, for instance, this is the, like, a simplified version of the query we use to insert the pages. So, this is a bit, yeah, cumbersome. Uh, here, this is two examples of uh, excerpts of uh, queries, cipher queries we use to, like, uh, compute the graph of web entities sitting on top of the pages. So, here, for instance, you see that we even try, like, uh, stored procedures, which were, uh, like, developed, developed by Benoit, which is somewhere in the room here. And, uh, yeah, so... As it seems, it's not as straightforward to traverse trees in Neo4j as it seems, because we have a tree, we have a graph, but it's not really, yeah, it's really useful to make, like, graph pattern queries, but if you have to, like, query a tree, go down the tree, go up the tree, and so on, uh, use some uh, depth first search, it's a bit cumbersome. So we went to, uh, onto a second prototype, which is called the trough. So, 
Uh, for this search graph, what we did was design our own on-file index, like to store the complicated multi-level graph. So people told us not to do it. That's the base. So yeah, it certainly seems crazy. So building an on-file structure from scratch is not really easy. We are not really experts of this uh, subject. So why would you do that? Uh, because you have like a lot of solution, already existing solution. Uh, what if the, like the, the structure crashes? What if the server like just shut down and your data is, is lost? So it's not so crazy. Why? Because like you cannot get faster than a tailored data structure. It's just a fact. Uh, we don't need deletions, which is a huge win because the, a lot of the complexity of uh, custom structures is always uh, related to deletions. And uh, we don't need an acid database. For us, it's totally overkill. So we just need an index, but a custom one. So an index does not store any original data. Why? Because in our case, we've got a MongoDB which stores all the actual data in a reliable way. And this means that the index can be completely lost, destroyed, utterly destroyed. We don't lose any data. We can recompute the index, so no biggie. So what's a trough? It's a trough. So the trough is a subtle mix between a tree. So I, I, think, I know people like uh, call it a tree or a tree. Uh, I will call it a tree and a graph. So hence the innovative, uh, incredibly innovative name. So uh, as you remember from uh, last time, so we've got a tree, uh, a tree of LRUs, which are like the reversed URL thingies. So on this thing, you have like one character is actually one node in the tree. So this is the basic thing we did. It's not optimal, but we will see that later. And on those nodes, we will be able like, to plant flags, uh, demarking the web entities, boundaries, and so on. So basically, the thing we are going to do is just like build a tree, which is going to store, at character level, the LRUs of our graphs. That's all. So how, we, how do we do that on file? So, it's quite simple. We use like fixed size block of binary data. So for instance, uh, 10 bytes or uh, 80 bytes or so on, we decide something. And because we have a fixed size and some uh, other uh, useful thing, we can like access the blocks in the file in a random access fashion. So it's quite fast, especially if you have SSDs. So accessing a specific page's metadata is actually done in O uh, of M, M being the length of the actual LRU. So uh, this is an example of the binary data we, we like, created for storing the tree nodes. So we have like, the character data. We have some flags uh, as bits in a byte. We have some pointers, like the next uh, thing, uh, the child, the parent, and another thing, which is a pointer to outlinks and inlinks. We are going to see that now. So we have a tree, but we also have a graph of pages. So how, how are we going like, to store this graph of pages? Well, the second part of the structure is actually a distinct file, which is going to store uh, a bunch of linked lists uh, between pages. That's all. So we just need like, to, store, to be able to store links out and in. So this page points toward this one, and this one is being pointed at by this one. So we store this the same way, using fixed block size of binary data. And uh, it's uh, even more simpler. We've got like a target, a weight, and a next. This means that this block is actually a stub. We just have the target. We don't have the source of the link because the source of the link is actually like pointing toward this file. So we have got like a pointer in the tree which uh, points toward another file. And this, in this one, we have like linked list of uh, target, wait, target, wait, target, wait, and so on and so on. Quite simple. So now we can store our links. So we have a graph of pages. So we have the tree of LRUs. We have the graph of pages. So we have a trough. So what about the multi-level graph? Because what we want, if you remember correctly, is not being able to query like a graph of web pages, but be able to query the graph of web entities which are aggregating and sitting over the graph of pages. So what we are going to do is select some nodes in the tree structure and flag them, telling the tree that this is the beginning of the a specific web entity realm. So the, it looks like that. So we're going to plant a flag here, 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 and so on. And we are able to like, determine when we are here, which web entity we belong to. Yeah, so now finding the web entity to which belong a page is obvious when we traverse. And what's more, if we bubble up, like for instance here, 
So this is more yeah, clear. For instance, if you go from the link and you go to the target of the link, you will arrive somewhere here. Well, you just have to bubble up towards the nearest flag and you know which is your web entity. Actually, we don't do that because we don't need to, but it's a possibility which is efficient. And this, of, uh, of course, can also be cached in RAM if we need to, to speed computations. Okay, uh, so now, uh, what's more, if you want to like, compute the web entities graph sitting on top of the web pages one, you just need to perform a simple depth first search on the tree. This seems costly, and usually it is, but here there is no other way around because you have to, do, to scan the old database at least once. And since the structure is quite lean and light, you won't need to read so much. Okay. So the question here is, was it worth it? Okay, so we did a benchmark on a, a small corpus, like a sample, 10% sample of a sizable corpus about uh, privacy and data privacy. So we have like uh, 1 million pages, 5 million uh, links, uh, 20,000 entities, and uh, 30,000 uh, links between those entities. So uh, we did the benchmark, we dropped the trick, and, and Mathieu like, presented the results of the benchmark. So to index the thing, to insert uh, pages in the database, Lucene took us like one hour and 55 minutes. Neo4j took one hour and four minutes, and the draft took 20 minutes. To process the graph, to be able like, to query the graph and get the aggregated graph, Lucene took 45 minutes, Neo4j six, and the draft took two minutes and 35 seconds. So for now, we are winning. Uh, on the disk space, Lucene took uh, 700 megabytes, Neo4j 1.5 gigabytes, and uh, the draft one gigabyte. So Lucene seems to win here, but not for long. Okay, so this is what we, we did in Copenhagen. So after Copenhagen, uh, we came back, uh, we like chilled, and uh, we decided to redevelop all the structure in Python. Uh, why? Because uh, we wanted to limit the amount of languages uses by, uh, used by like, uh, our uh, crawler's uh, core. And uh, by doing that, we made some new discoveries on the way and we improved uh, the performance of the draft even more. So you have the, the, the source code if you want to, to check it. So here it is a bonus section. I will just go fast because we don't have time. So what we discovered is actually that single character tree is slow because that the stem level is better. If you store like .com or Google or uh, something like this, uh, instead of a single character, you compress a lot of space and you go faster because the structure is even lighter and uh, voila. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the issue here is that we had to find a way to store variable length uh, stems because a character is quite easy to, to hold, it's just a byte, whereas a stem could have like a 16 byte uh, or even more. So we designed the thing to do that. So at the beginning the results were bad because uh, we had linked lists. In the tree, the children were organized as linked lists, so you cannot go beyond two, uh, 256 uh, children, but here you can go like uh, 1 million. So uh, we try to uh, do something else. So we organize the children as uh, binary search trees. And this is actually another structure which is called a Turner research tree. So look it up. <laughs> and uh, after what, we try to auto balance those uh, binary search trees because notoriously those trees can like degrade to a linked list. But uh, it did not make for anything because like reads were uh, slower, writes were slower because actually like the order we insert the thing in the tree generates uh, enough entropy not to degrade the, the structure. And finally we switched to using uh, varchars, uh, so reserving one byte you know the length of the string uh, so we don't have to trim null bytes on the thing and we double performance. Okay so here we are now. So we went from uh, 45 minutes to 20 seconds to compute the graph. And uh, actually uh, now, uh, which is normal, the web is the bottleneck again, which should be uh, the case in almost uh, every case when you do uh, this kind of stuff. So uh, the current version of the crawler Hive uh, uses this index in production uh, today, so it works. And a uh, final mea culpa, so yes, we probably use the Lucent badly, yes, we probably use the Neo4j badly, but when you have to twist the system that much, so meaning that you have like to tweak the internals or uh, maybe add a stored procedure or so on, uh, aren't you in fact developing something new? So it, it, it just like uh, yeah, uh, just to say that you can perf uh, like you develop a, a custom index and it might be a, a good thing to do. 
But uh, of course, uh, we are not experts in this uh, subject, so we are confident that we can further improve the structure, and uh, we are confident that the people in this very room uh, can help us do so. So please uh, uh, bash our uh, ideas and uh, tell, uh, tell us uh, that we can do better and uh, in a different way. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Yeah. So um, you, uh, the, you store this index in a file. Do you write your binary data directly, or do you use something intermediate to store three byte structures? Uh, yeah. So we just like use uh, two row files, two row binary files, and we write in it, like using the the file system APIs, and that's all. Per corpus. Per so corpus. We, we, we you split things. We have this for each corpus. As the like the disk space used is really really low, we don't have to like shard or split the things yet. Maybe in the future, but for not now. Yes. Maybe the same question repeated. Um, you mentioned uh, MongoDB, I think, two minutes ago. Yeah. And then you say you speak of raw files, but why did you choose something like GDBM or whatever? Uh, because I don't know what it is. Okay, it's an index of files where you have just the key associated to data. Uh, okay, so it's, it's like uh, better random access for blo uh, binary blocks, or is it something different like a hash map? I, I'm not sure I, uh, I get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just because we didn't know about it, so we like did it from scratch. Okay. But in Java. No, uh, so the original prototype was in Java, but like the our actual implementation now is Python. Okay, and you you speak the uh, binary file. What? Your files are completely binary and platform dependent. Yeah. Uh, binary, but not platform dependent. I mean, if you switch it to <coughs> to an ARM processor, it will be the same. Mm, probably yes. I guess so. Okay. I'm not sure though. <laughs> yeah. So I'm guessing this means that the store itself is bound to a single machine configuration. Can you speak louder? I didn't understand everything. So, if I understand correctly, the question it's uh, is everything. I mean, is the whole software uh, relying on a, on a single machine? Uh, currently, yes, and we install it. Uh, now we have an easy install with Docker, so it installs everything in uh, in containers. Uh, but uh, you could, if you want, uh, in the configuration, if you do the manual install, you can uh, set the crawler on a different machine and uh, use. Uh, I mean, and, but the, the data itself will be stored on the same machine as uh, uh, where. Where the process is happening, yeah, not the, the call can be separated. Yeah, I guess also that uh, for now we didn't have like corpuses that would overcome the storage of a single machine because the kind of calls that are performed here are, are quite quali qualitative. Like you have a researcher that will select finally the things he wants, and so usually uh, as a human is involved, you you won't have too much data. So. For now, it's not possible like to shard the, the thing and have a really, really scalable crawler, but that's not really the, the point, I guess. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much.